if, you know, just to summarize things, we've talked about God's original desire to have a human family coexisting with his supernatural family. Heaven comes to earth, we have Eden, we have the creation of humankind as God's imagers, his proxies, his stand-ins, again, whatever vocabulary helps. They are his children, they are fit for sacred space, they are tasked with making the rest of the world like Eden, to spread the goodness of God, to spread life as God wants it lived everywhere on the globe. That's destroyed with the fall, the first of three rebellions. The fall brings upon humanity a death problem and a separation from God. That rebellious path continues. We have the precursor event to the flood, Genesis 6, 1 through 4, which produces a number of bad results. In immediate Old Testament history, we have a lethal threat to the people of God, Israel, in the form of the Nephilim and their descendants. Moses, Joshua, and David take care of that problem. But what they cannot address is the fact that fallen sons of God, the watchers against supernatural rebels, teach, deceive, misdirect, blind human beings to their own self-destruction. They accelerate depravity. There are, you know, there's an, an animus there. Humans are essentially taught to more efficiently destroy their own lives and the lives of those around them. Their hearts are turned to idolatry. God judges that with the flood. He consigns the rebellious supernatural beings to the pit, to the abyss, chains of gloomy darkness in the language of Peter and Jude. By the way, I think Revelation 9 describes the release of the watchers as a precursor to the end of days, which ultimately is a transition to you know, the day of the Lord and the future age, the age to come. But we've got a serious problem there. And then we have the Babel problem where the nations are divorced from God they are assigned, allotted is the biblical word, to the sons of God who corrupt them and in turn show their own corruption by turning the hearts of, of everyone to idolatry, soliciting worship from humans instead of directing them back to the true God and ruling them according to the moral character of the true God. They turn their populations into their slaves and destroy them. This is why the psalmist cries out for an end to this situation. So humanity is fragmented. It is in a maelstrom of depravity. It is separated from the true God and the knowledge of the true God. It's just one big mess. It's one big chaotic mess. And so the expectation is that the seed of Abraham, the seed, the Messiah, is going to show up and fix this all three of these, all, all of these conditions. And again, we, we can't drill down into all these things, but I mentioned there are certain theological signals to the birth and the genealogy of Jesus that are aimed at the Watcher story. We can't get into that now. We know about the resurrection, the, 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 the cross event, the cross, the death of Jesus and the resurrection. We know that that takes care of the death problem because resurrection, again, he is the first fruits uh, of the resurrection, and we will inherit the resurrection. We will be raised with him at the last day to eternal life. Again, we, we know those points of the theology, so we know how the work of Jesus cures the death problem. It brings the believer back into the family of God. But I want to focus here on a few things in the Gospels and in the epistles, and ultimately in the book of Revelation, that sort of touch on the other two things. The problem of depravity, the problem of cosmic geography especially. There are things in the New Testament that what we just described in the last hour 
little seeds of that, little breadcrumbs of those things are seeded throughout the New Testament. And the problem is our ability to detect them because we don't quite know what we're looking at because we have not spent enough time in our Old Testament understanding it in its own context to be able to see the breadcrumb trails. But they are there. Uh, my book, Reversing Hermon, drills down specifically on the Genesis 6 story. How does that story bleed into the New Testament and specifically at the mission of Jesus? Again, we'll, we'll say a little bit about that here, but I want to focus on cosmic geography because that's, I think, there's an important aspect to that that's really tied into our destiny that really matters, and I think especially for our gathering today. So you're only going to get a little, a little taste of what's lurking in your Bible, <laughs> um, what will jump out at you if you're aware. <laughs> um, and it's, it's good stuff, really, it is. So the ministry of Jesus, you know, Jesus' first coming, the first advent, he is going to inaugurate the kingdom, means he's going to kickstart the kingdom of God, the rule of God on earth once more. And he's also going to make a mockery in his own special way of the cosmic powers. So he does this in different ways, and just again, just a smattering here. It's no coincidence that the inauguration, the beginning of the kingdom, when, when Jesus begins his ministry, he starts talking about the kingdom. I mean, John had done this as a precursor as well. But he starts saying things like the kingdom of God is present, the kingdom of God is among you, you know, so on and so forth. But when he starts talking about the kingdom, when he inaugurates his ministry, he also, to demonstrate his authority, he couples those announcements with specific episodes of the expulsion of demons. If you look in your New Testament, you will see when the kingdom gets talked about, you have these sorts of events. That is not a coincidence. It's intentional, it's deliberate. And I think one of the more interesting ones is here in Matthew 8. We're probably gonna go a little past three o'clock, but oh well, just drag me away. <laughs> I've been good to this point. <laughs> okay, Jesus heals two men with demons. When he came to the other side to the country of the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes in, in other synoptics, gospels, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? And then we get the pigs and the swine and all that. What I want to draw your attention to is how the demons address Jesus, okay? Oh, son of God. Usually, when people address Jesus, they call him son of David in the Gospels. It's a consistent pattern. But here the demons somehow know that he's not just the son of David, he's the son of God. If you go over to the same account in Mark, Crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me? This is legion, so it's still more than one. What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In Luke, Luke is going to use the same language, son of the most high. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is, isn't it unusual, or doesn't it draw your attention, that when Jesus goes into territory, that is under Gentile control. They're raising pigs, okay? That, that's an indication, okay? <laughs> and, and, you know, historically, this part of, part of the land was under Gentile control in Jesus' day. That when he's among Jews, they refer to him either as Jesus or the Son of God or some pejorative, you know? But when he's in Gentile turf and he confronts supernatural powers, they refer to him as the Son of God and the Son of the Most High. Why should that stand out? Because 
he is Lord of the Gentile nations as well. Jesus goes into Gentile places and does things to telegraph a simple point. I am not the Messiah of the Jew alone. I have dominion over territory that is under the authority, at least to this point, of other gods. And they know it. They call him son of the most high. Where do we see that language in the Old Testament? The Babel story. Okay, it, it's designed to take your mind back by using that specific phrase, back to the conditions of cosmic geography in the Old Testament. And to telegraph the point that the supernatural beings know who this is. Now, I agree with Paul, and we'll get to Paul in a moment, where Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, you know, verses 6 through 8, said, you know, had the rulers of this world, which is a you know, Pauline phrase for supernatural powers, and, and the Gospels use it too, Satan is called the ruler of this world and all that. But Paul says, had the rulers of this world known what the outcome would have been, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, they're not idiots. They're not thinking like, oh, Jesus is here and he's here to die on the cross. And so if we kill him, that's the beginning of the end for us. Let's do that. <laughs> now, they know who he is and they know why he's there. Why else would the Son of God show up? Why else would the Son of the Most High show up? He's here to do this silly Eden thing again. He wants to reclaim the nations. He wants to kickstart Eden again. He wants to bring the nations back into the family. He wants to restore Eden. He wants God to have his way. Well, we're not going to let that happen. So the, the easy solution for them is to kill him, which is exactly what God needs to happen. Okay, now, Jesus knows the plan. He knows the mechanism for this, but they don't. Like Paul says, had they known, they never would have done this. They're not idiots. Also, what Jesus does when he starts talking about the kingdom, the first time he sends out disciples, he sends out 70. Some of your New Testaments will say 72. It doesn't matter because it refers to the same thing. Why 70? He doesn't send out 12. You know, 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel. No, he sends out 70. Why? 70, if you use the traditional Hebrew text of Genesis 10, the nations involved in the Babel story, if you count them, there's 70 of them. In the Septuagint, there's 72 because the translator divided two. He divided a couple pairs. That's why you get the number difference. But both numbers refer back to the table of nations that were divided at Babel. If you are a literate Jew and you happen to be either on the scene or you read the gospel where Jesus, the son of David, son of the Most High, starts talking about the kingdom and sends out 70 disciples who have authority over demons, you know what's going on. You know what this signals. He is here to take back the nations. I am not the God and the Messiah of the Jew alone. I am Lord of every last inch of turf here. And this is a symbolic gesture to make that point. It's a cosmic geographical act to those who have Babel ringing in their heads. You know, this, is, this coincides with Satan, quote, falling like lightning from heaven, Luke 10, 18. You also get the dragon cast down in Revelation 12, which again, if you read the passage, and I already referenced it, refers to the first coming of the Messiah. The first coming of the Messiah results in some sort of casting down of the devil. What is that? What might that mean? Okay, again, this isn't original to me, but I think this is the view that makes the most sense, given all the other things we've talked about and a lot of the things we haven't talked about today. 
The serpent figure, the original rebel that we know as Satan, was cast down in Eden to the underworld, to, to, the, to the, the earth. And, and in, in Israelite cosmology, the underworld is in the earth. So he's cast out of heaven to the earth. He becomes Lord of the dead. So it can't refer to that because this is something different that is associated with the announcement of the kingdom. Okay, my view is that what this means is that Satan is expelled from the presence of God or the, the role of the accuser who brings charge against people because he owns them. Another way of saying it, if Satan has rightful ownership of every human life because everything dies, one of his roles that's described elsewhere in scripture is to accuse the brethren. If you, you know, look at, at this role, the terminology of the accuser is drawn from different passages. You know, Job 1 and 2 is probably the most familiar just for the idea of accusation. But he lays claim to every human being on the planet. When the kingdom of God is begun and the king announces it and the king is going to give his life to make the kingdom of God a reality, that's over and done with. In what way? Here's the point. Anyone who's a member of Jesus' kingdom is no longer under the authority of the Lord of the dead because of the resurrection. So if you are a member of that kingdom, this dude over here has nothing to say. He no longer owns you. Your destiny is no longer with him. He is a prosecutor without a case. Okay? That's what he is. And again, what I'm, what I'm suggesting is when these things happen, when they're said in the Gospels, they have a context that drifts back into the Old Testament you know, that needs to be you know, noodled a little bit when it gets to that. Now, I've alluded to this one. Here's a map. This is God's leading of Moses and Joshua. When they, I'll try to get out of my own way here. When they are done with the 40 years of wandering, as I mentioned before, God directs Moses and Joshua to go up the other side of Jordan, the eastern side, if you're looking at the map from your direction. It's not Canaan proper, it's the other side. And he tells them in Deuteronomy 2 and 3, let's just take a look at it, even though I alluded to this before. Deuteronomy 2 and 3, he says, you know, the, the writer says, as soon as all the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them. For I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I've already given it to the sons of Lot, who are, again, peripherally related to Abraham. I've already given it to the sons of Lot. It's also counted as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites call them Zamzumim, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. But, let me click in there and find my mouse. But the Lord destroyed them. The Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled them in their place, as he did for the people of Esau who lived in Seir when he destroyed the Horites before them and dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day, as he did for the Avim, who lived in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftorim, you know, who came from Kaftor. These are all also roots of the Philistines. And he goes down through the list, and he says, look, on the other side of Jordan, you don't molest the people of Moab and Ammon because I've already either given it to descendants of Abraham, and there's no giant problem there. Already took care of that. Descendants of Esau, you know, cleared them out. The Ammonite, you know, we, we don't have a problem there. What we do have a problem with is Bashan. The region up here to the north at the top of the map, Bashan. Let's get a better look at it. This is the region of Bashan. You see the Sea of Galilee right here. Bashan is, the, again, the territorial name. Ashtaroth and Edrai are two significant cities. Let me see if I have, yeah, I have this note here. Just a few notes about the region of Bashan. 
In Canaanite, it was known as Bathon, T-H, which is a word for serpent. That's a little creepy. I mean, Israelites are going to be a little creeped out by that. Ashtaroth and Edri in Canaanite, in Ugaritic, that's a Canaanite language or Northwest Semitic language, those two cities are mentioned by name and they are described as gateways to the netherworld. They freaked even the pagans out, okay? So it's like, we just don't, you know, like we don't really want to go there. It's just, Bashan is kind of creepy to begin with and we don't want to hang out at these places because these are gateways to the netherworld, to the underworld. In Old Testament times, at the, at the top of, what we'll see in a moment, at the, the, the top of Bashan, the region there, there's a mountain, it's Mount Hermon. We'll come back to that point. But at the foot of Mount Hermon was built a temple to Baal. Baal is referred to as the Lord of the Underworld in Canaanite literature. He's Lord of the Dead. Baal Zabul. Baal in the Gospels. Baal Zabul is Ugaritic for Prince Baal. Baal is Baal, Zabul is the word for prince, the Lord of the Dead. This is why Baal is a Satan figure, okay, in a lot of this, this material. Prince Baal. I mean, so this read, this is not where you'd go like for R and R. Okay. <laughs> Where, where, where do we want to go for vacation this year? Oh, Dad, I've got a great idea. Let's go to Bashan. No, it, really, it's just, you know, think of something else. Okay. So here we are, a little bit more of a blow-up. You've got Bashan, Sea of Galilee here in Jesus' day. Just fix that location in your mind. You've got Ashtaroth and Edri nearby. There again, Sea of Galilee, a little bit north this is going to be actually adjacent to where the temple of Baal was erected in Old Testament days, is Caesarea Philippi, in the, also known in Jesus' day as Banias or Panias with a P. What happens at Caesarea Philippi? It's at the foot of Mount Hermon, okay, in the region of Bashan. This is like, this is like ground zero for just awful, evil, chaotic, nasty stuff. What happens at Caesarea Philippi? This is the place that Jesus goes with his disciples and they're at, you know, there, there they are. Caesarea Philippi, you've got the, the grotto of Pan, Pan, Banyas, Bashan, all this stuff, the gates of hell. And this is the place where Jesus has this conversation with his disciples where he says, who do people, who do men say that I am? And the disciples, well, some say this and some say that. You know, and, and he, he asked Peter, who do you say I am? And he says, Thou are, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, that's good, Peter. You know, don't get a big head about it because the spirit of God had to show you that. You're not that smart. Okay? <laughs> but we'll give you some points. Uh, he, he says, you know, you're Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, I finally got to Bashan and specifically to this location last year. It's really hard to miss the rock. It's dominated by a big rock, a cliff. And inside is the Grotto of Pan. In Jesus' day, it was also a temple of Zeus, which is a real slap in the face to the true God because Zeus was conceived as the most high. Uh, in, in pagan religion. But a lot of people argue about this. Okay? They say, well, you know, the way we should interpret this is Jesus is saying, you know, Peter, Peter, and upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And Petros, Peter, sounds like Petra rock, so Jesus is making a pun. And Peter's the first pope, so we should all be Catholic. And the Protestants say, no, 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 no. Now, the, the rock is, is Christ himself, and, and the rock was God in the Old Testament, because that's what 1 Corinthians 10 says, the rock was, was Jesus, the rock was God. And so we're going to take that and import it into the Gospels, and none of us should be Catholic. We should all be Protestant. 
Okay, I, what I'm suggesting, and I'm, again, I'm not alone. I didn't come up with this view. This is a, a fairly common view. That the rock they're talking about is where they're standing. Okay, because it was known as the gates of hell. It's the place where the Lord of the dead was worshipped. And, you know, you got these locations in the region that you go visit the Lord of the dead. You know, it, it's this place. So I don't think the Protestants or the Catholics are correct on this. I think Jesus is saying, you all know what this place is. Upon this, this rock right here, I'm going to build my church. This is where it begins. And the gates of hell, a lot of our translations have, this is ESV, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now you'll notice, at least here, you see the word against has a little arrow and it doesn't have any English words under it? That's because the word against in English is not represented by a Greek word in the original text. It's supplied by the translator to help it make sense. See, the gates of hell will not prevail against it sounds like the church is taking a beating and the church is going to survive while the gates of hell beat against it. It'll be okay because it's the church. No, actually you should translate it without that preposition. And then you'd come up with something like, the gates of hell will not withstand it. See, that reverses the image. Now it's not the church taking the beating, it's the church administering the beating. Okay? So, I mean, what you have Jesus saying here is, is, in effect, you all know what this place is. I'm going to turn Satan's domain into his tomb. Okay? We are going to reverse what's going on here. And, and the real kicker is, well, we'll get to, to, that, to that part. Oh, let's, let's just go. I'll get to the kicker in a moment. <laughs> right after this incident, it says, after six days, I mean, they're, they're there at Caesarea Philippi, six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain. Again, if you're there, you just look around and like, where's a high mountain here? I mean, we got this big rock here and it's a cliff, but it's not a mountain, it's a cliff. Oh, well, there's one right over there. How could we miss it? It's Mount Hermon. What happened at Mount Hermon? Again, if you're reading Second Temple Jewish material about the Genesis 6 story, Mount Hermon is where the watchers descend and covenant together with themselves to corrupt humanity. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up into Mount Hermon, and what happens there? It's the transfiguration. So like, you know, he, Jesus goes there, and he manifests who he really is. He exposes himself you know, in his glory. As if to say what? I'm here. Do something about it. Okay, my view is that when Jesus does this at Caesarea Philippi and Mount Hermon, he is picking a fight. This is well into his ministry. And the reason I say that is what happens after. This is just some stuff about Hermon. The, the, uh, the Gospels actually don't identify the mountain. The church tradition says it's Mount Tabor. You know why? Because Constantine's mom said it was. <laughs> I, I'm not making that up. Constantine's mom was a serious believer, and she fancied herself as like an, an archaeologist. And so she went around to places in the Holy Land and said, this is, what this, this is where this happened, this is where that happened, this is this place. And people are like, hey, you're the emperor's mom. We're not going to disagree. You know, and it just becomes church tradition. But the, the, the gospels never identify it. And if you're in the region, there's only one mountain candidate there, and that's Hermon, but oh well. You know, and again, it's not just me. Lots of people take this view I'm giving to you. But it's really interesting that after these two events, you read this in Mark. After he goes to Caesarea Philippi, and he pokes Satan in the eye, and he goes to Mount Hermon and digs, you know, that whole bunch, okay? It says this, he began to teach them, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things 
and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He's picking a fight. It's time to get the show on the road. Now, Peter freaks out, if you remember the passage. This is the passage where Peter says, no way. You know, like, this isn't going to happen to you. And then Jesus has to say, look, get behind me, Satan. And the the whole point is, if you oppose this, you're on his side. You're an adversary. Don't put yourself in an adversarial position to what I have to do, what I'm going to do. This is why I'm here. But he begins to teach them that he has to die. So what happens? They leave this area. They go to Jerusalem. And that's when you have Palm Sunday. And a week later, he's dead. Mission accomplished. It's a provocation. Jesus goes to these places and provokes a response. And you know, you know the gospel stories about Satan entering into Judas, and you know, you know all you know, the rest of that. But he does these things to provoke and set the stage for what must happen. He must die. Why does he have to die? To defeat death, you have to have a resurrection. You can't have a resurrection unless you die. It's as plain as day. But they don't, it doesn't register with them. And again, I don't want to poke fun at the disciples because I don't think they were, they were dumb. The, the real issue is, and I discussed this in Unseen Realm at length. Here's the passage in Paul I alluded to earlier. Among the mature, we do impart wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Oh, yeah, they are. Paul has read Psalm 82. You're going to die like men. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The disciples didn't understand it either. Do you realize, this little little bunny trail here, do you realize there isn't a single passage that has, in the Old Testament, that prophesies a Messiah who will be God incarnate, who will die a sacrificial death and rise from the dead? Now, all those individual items are somewhere in the Old Testament, and most of them kind of cryptically, The point is that the plan is scattered throughout the Old Testament. The pieces are not put together. We only have the pieces put together because the New Testament is written in hindsight. Okay, in the unseen realm I talk about, this is, I refer to this as the messianic mosaic. It's like a puzzle. It's like you have to put put a puzzle together without the box lid, okay? The pieces are just fragmented. It's only afterwards that the picture becomes clear. I mean, I love Luke 24. This is after the resurrection, and they have the risen Christ, the disciples assembled there, the risen Christ is standing in front of them, and they don't get it. Luke actually says that Jesus had to open their minds so that they could understand. And again, it's not that they're dumb. It's that they didn't know all the pieces or how the pieces went together. They only know this in hindsight. You know, Jesus tells them the, the Spirit's going to guide you into all this. You know, the Spirit's going to help you out. And he does. You know, and, and you know, that, that's why when, when, they, you know, when the Gospels get written and you know, the, the disciples are out there doing their thing in the book of Acts, they come to understand how everything fit together. And the the text will say, and then they remembered what Jesus said about this or that passage. It's like, oh. You know, another piece goes right where it belongs. They're they're assembling it as they go and as they, they go about their ministries. They don't know it now. Supernatural evil doesn't know it. Had they known it, they never would have done it, is Paul's point. You know, so they are duped. 
they are led by the nose and duped by Jesus and by the Father to do precisely the thing that was the beginning of the end for them because there's no going back. The kingdom has been planted and now it will grow. Jesus says, you know, I, I have to ascend to the Father. The ascension is actually just as important as the resurrection. Why? Because unless I ascend, the Spirit will not come. And this is why, I mean, we, we could go into all sorts of stuff here, but just as Jesus is identified with the Father, you know, he, he is God, but he's not the Father and all that stuff, so the Spirit gets talked about in the New Testament as, he, as if he's Jesus, but still distinct. You'll have phrases like Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ interchanged in the same verse. Twice Paul says, refers to Jesus as the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, he, Paul's not denying Trinitarianism. He's just identifying the two and elsewhere he'll separate them. This is how, again, we talk about Jesus in relation to the Father. The same thing happens with the Spirit in relation to Jesus. How else can Jesus say, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age? Or where two or three are gathered together, there I am in their midst. You know, you, you have a physical resurrection, and yet there's, in some sense, there's this unity in some way of Jesus and the Spirit. But the Spirit will not come until Jesus ascends. He ascends to be at the right hand of the Father to, if you've got a kingdom, you've got a rule, you've got to be a ruler. And the Spirit, you know, again, we'll get into some of this. The Spirit's coming is pretty important, again, for depravity. Let's look at Acts briefly. You have restoring the one family of God and reclaiming the nations. Okay, this is the story of Pentecost. Again, how many times, how many sermons have you heard on the story of Pentecost? You know, both because it's important and because it's important, you hear it a lot, it's familiar except for what you're missing. It's like most of the Bible, really. When the day of Pentecost arrived, again, and it's not because we're, we're dumb and they were smart, it's because we don't have the world, we, we, we don't have the eyes that they had to, to catch certain things. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire, you know, settle on them. Now I want to just, I have the, the, the column here. I have the word divided clicked on and the column. This is the Greek term diamerizo, okay, to be divided. whoop de doo okay. Well, if we search for that term in the Septuagint, the Septuagint was the Bible of the early church and the New Testament writers. Three quarters of the time they quote the Old Testament, they use the Greek translation of the Old Testament to make their point. Sometimes they quote from the Hebrew and then they do the translation on the fly, but other times they quote from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Because, you know, the world speaks Greek. If we search for diamerizo in the Septuagint, it doesn't show up that many times, 19, but one of them, lo and behold, is Deuteronomy 32, wow. where the nations are divided. You say, ah, that might be a coincidence. Okay. Keep reading. Now, they were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. If we click on bewildered, we look at the Greek term there, it's soon ke'o. If we search for that in the Septuagint, guess where that shows up? Genesis 11, which is the story of the Tower of Babel. We've got two terms in the book of Acts, which is about people being enabled to speak in other languages because the nations have other languages, not just one that hook us back into the division of the nations at Babel. I would suggest to you that Luke wants us to think of the reversing of the nations here. He wants us to think of Babel because now all of a sudden the language issue isn't going to matter. 
God is going to supernaturally, you know, have people speak in these other languages. Why? What is God doing at Pentecost? Well, here, here's a map. I know you can't really see it that well. But if you, you know, you could look later in your, in your Bible in the back. This is a map with all of the place names from Acts chapter 2. Again, this is just Acts 2. This is Pentecost. The list, if you read the list in Acts 2, proceeds from east, and the right-hand side here, east to west. It moves in a westerly direction. It starts with the easternmost geographical points and starts moving toward the sea. And then when you hit the sea, it divides up and covers the northern Mediterranean and the southern Mediterranean, all the way through Cyrenica in Africa, which is almost to Italy you know, or Rome, but we get Italy in the list as well. You say, well, is that supposed to mean something? Yeah, it is. A number of those names, a number of those names are plucked out of the table of nations in Genesis 10. Others get a new name because we're going from Semitic language to Greek. Okay. The point is that the people in Jerusalem, they're Jews. They're scattered all over the known world. They're scattered among the nations, the 70 nations that are known to the biblical writers. They're Jews. How'd they get there? Exile. They were scattered to the wind because of their idolatry. They were put into the nations that God disinherited and divorced himself from. Why would God do that? Because God plays the long game. God knows that at some point, the Messiah is going to come. He's going to die. He's going to rise again. The event of Pentecost is going to occur where Jews from all of these nations are going to show up in Jerusalem and they're going to see something pretty spectacular. They're going to see people of their own kin group speaking in the other languages from the regions they're from and they're going to be telling them the story of this guy from Nazareth who said he was the Messiah and he was crucified by the Romans and he rose on the third day. And they're going to believe. 3,000 of them believe. And you know what they do after they believe? They go home. They're like little cell groups planted among the nations. This is why when Paul and other people get to some of these places, there's already believers. It's like a dandelion. You know, God essentially blows the dandelion and the seed of the kingdom scatters all over the Mediterranean to the nations. The messaging is pretty clear. God is now about the business of reclaiming the nations for himself. If you read through the rest of the book of Acts, again, it's not a coincidence. Remember Acts chapter 1? You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Samaria. We have an episode in Acts chapter 8 about Samaria. Why is Samaria interesting? Samaria was the northern kingdom. It was apostate after the kingdom divided. And when the northern kingdom was conquered, the Assyrians in this case came in, they uprooted the populations and deported them to other parts of their empire. And then they took people from other parts of the empire and imported them back into Samaria. And those people would get married and have babies, and you have half-breed Jews, the Samaritans. And the Jews have nothing to do with them because they're not pure. But God is interested in them.
the gospel goes to Samaria. And right after the Samaritan episode, this is Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, all the way in the south. All the way down to the south, you know, the left side of the Dead Sea. There's somebody even from there. Now, this is a little more interesting because we're not told in the Old Testament why Ethiopia would be significant, but we are told in the intertestamental period. There was a long tradition and archaeological evidence, abundant evidence and textual evidence as well, that a group of Jews left Judah during the time of Manasseh and possibly earlier to escape the idolatry there and they moved down the Nile and they built a colony at Elephantine. And there were other Jews that settled a little west, again, in these African regions. The gospel needs to go to them too. You see a pattern already. The gospel is being taken to the Jew first and also then to the barbarian. That actually started with the barbarian, the Greek, because of Acts 2. But while that was, again, theological messaging, the book of Acts proceeds in a more orderly fashion. It wants the Jewish reader to know, well, you know, yeah, it, this is your Messiah too, so let's just do it, do it geographically. We hit Samaria, check that off the list. We've got Ethiopia, check that off the list because there's a Jewish presence there. Philip, after he witnesses to the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, just read it, the spirit plucks him out of the chariot and deposits him in Azotus. What's Azotus? Azotus is one of the Philistine cities. It is in a region that was not under the dominion of the kingdom of Solomon at its height. The kingdom of Solomon, the kingdom of David missed that one. But the writer of Acts, Luke wants you to know that that belongs to God. It's actually covenant territory in the original territorial promises. Every place that matters to the Jewish promises to Abraham gets picked up in either Acts 2 or the rest of the book of Acts. Damascus. Paul's headed, you know, this is where Paul has his conversion. Why is Damascus mentioned in the book of Acts? Remember back to the story of Abraham when Lot gets kidnapped and Abraham has to proceed, you know, to rescue him. He pursues, and the Rephaim are in this list in Genesis 14. <laughs> He, he pursues this band that, that captured Lot with 318 men. He rescues Lot. And where do they find Lot? Where do they catch up to them and rescue Lot? Damascus. Do you remember God had said, every place that your eye can see and the, and the place that on your, your feet tread on is going to be your land. God didn't forget that. Again, the, the place names are here for a reason. To the Jewish reader, Luke wants to communicate the gospel was taken to every place that Jews are. And that's important because the, 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 the Jewish nation needs to be brought back together, all 12 tribes, not just two. They're still in exile, even in the New Testament period. Only two of them ever came back. But God has to heal this rift, and then he's going to use them. He's going to plant them all over the, 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 the known world. They're going to go back home. You know, wherever they're at, they're going to get witness to, they're going to believe, they're going to be there because this is now a beachhead for the kingdom of God in the Gentile world. The gospel is seeded in all these places. And you go through the book of Acts, it's to the Jew first, also Greek. This is, this is Paul's pattern as well. And it's conveyed visually. I mean, we, we could go through, you know, the last Gentile or the last Jew to be converted is the one in Damascus before you get to Cornelius. Cornelius is, again, a God-fearing Gentile. It's a transition point in the book of Acts. All the Jewish stuff has been taken care of. But now we have to get the gospel because he, the, Jesus is the Messiah of the nations, not just Israel. And so we get the ministry of Paul. And Paul, you know, we, we know what Paul does, but one of the cool things about Paul is he has this obsession with Spain. Okay? Romans 15, 20 
Thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, I mean, I've, I've you know, been everywhere I needed to go, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. Now, he, he wants to, I mean, he's on a ship, he's in chains. Okay, and he's either writing part of Romans there, or he writes it once he gets into Rome and he hasn't seen them yet because he's in jail. You know, we don't know the exact circumstance, you know, when Romans was written, but he has not seen the believers at Rome yet, so he's writing them, I can't wait to see you guys. You know, Romans 1, I want to impart into you some spiritual gift, and we got big plans, and it's like, dude, you're in chains. Like, you know, <laughs> what's going on here? And he actually says to them, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. Paul, you ain't going anywhere. You know, you're, you're manacled to the ship here. Paul is convinced and he really earnestly wants to go to Spain. And I like, I like to say, what, what does he like, the food? I mean, what, what's, what's the thing about Spain? Why? Who, who would care? Why does he have Spain on the brain? It's because he knows Genesis 10. Now, again, here's our map of Genesis 10, the disinherited nations. Spain, if you know your geography, is right there. And it's Tarshish. You say, well, who cares? Well, let's go back a little bit. The book of Acts covers all of the geographical nations, the geographical regions disinherited by God at Babel to this line. This is a little bit past Italy. There's only one nation in the entire table of nations that is not covered. It's Tarshish. It's Spain. Paul knows this. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And again, I can't prove it, but I believe that Paul believed he would not die until he reached Spain. That's the outlier. I have been to every place that is under dominion of these other gods that was disinherited at Babel except for one. My mission is not over until I get to the last one. So there you have it. I mean, he, why else would he care? Why else would he care about Spain? Because it's Tarshish. He, you know, he quotes Isaiah 66 as well, which talks about the kingdom, including Tarshish and all this stuff. He knows what he's doing. Here's another thing about Paul. Paul does refer to demons occasionally. 1 Corinthians 10, 21 and 22, he actually quotes Deuteronomy 32, 17 there about avoiding fellowship with demons. But most of Paul's vocabulary are these words, and you're familiar with them if you've read the New Testament. Rulers, principalities, powers, thrones, authorities, you know, all this kind of stuff. What do they all have in common? They are terms used both in the New Testament and outside the New Testament for geographical rulership. In Paul's world, He's not just dealing with demons. Demons are low level. The big players are the ones that control the nations, to whom authority was given as a punishment and who became corrupt. This is the, you know, those other guys, they're, they're the spirits in prison. We don't really need to worry about them until maybe the day of the Lord, okay? okay but the ones we really need to worry about now are the ones who control and have dominion geographically. His vocabulary reflects his worldview. It reflects his theology. Epistles and Revelation. The believer's destiny, and this will be where we end. A couple slides here. I've already mentioned, again, the, the unusual feature that the language of God's supernatural family, sons of God, holy ones in the Old Testament overwhelmingly refer to, again, the supernatural kids that God has. In the New Testament, the words holy ones and sons of God, children of God, never refer to the supernatural beings. They refer to human believers. The language shifts. Again, it's not a coincidence. Believers 
are the sons and daughters of God. The kingdom is the beginning of this Eden, this Edenic vision restored. Now let's just give you a few examples. John 1.12. But as many as believed on him or in him, to them gave he the authority to become the sons of God. It's John 1.12. 1 John 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, the children of God. And that's what we are. Galatians 3.26, if you are Christ's, or, you know, if you are Christ's, if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. Doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Now, that's a dramatic statement because who else is Abraham's seed? That would be Jesus. Okay, he is the seed. Romans 8, 14. The creation groans and travails, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's waiting for the new Eden. Who populates the new Eden? The sons of God. Who are the sons of God? That would be us. Earlier in Romans 8, he refers to anyone who has the spirit is a child of God, children of God, sons of God. Hebrews 2, I think, is the best passage for this. You know, it, it's a great New Testament divine counsel passage. Um, for it is fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing, bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. This is why he, Jesus, again in the context, is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers, to my siblings. Okay, better way to translate it. Brothers and sisters, siblings. I will tell of your name to my siblings in the midst of the congregation. What congregation? It's the counsel of God. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Do you realize that when you pass on, or again, when the, either the latter of the Lord comes, you will be introduced in the divine council to God, and God will be introduced to you by Jesus. That's the picture. That's Hebrews 2. Again, the language is intentional. Revelation 2, I think, is, is great. Nevertheless, hold fast to what you have until I come. The one who conquers, the one who conquers, the one who overcomes, and who keeps my words until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. Okay, this is Jesus speaking about you. The one who overcomes, I will give him authority over the nations. He will shepherd them with an iron rod. Jesus is quoting a messianic passage, not about himself, but about you. That's just crazy. Like, Jesus, don't you know proper hermeneutics? Like, you know, this is about you. And he said, no, yeah, I get that, but it's about you too. Why? Because we're siblings. He will shepherd them with an iron with an iron rod, he will break them in pieces like jars made of clay. As I also have received from my father, I will give him the morning star. It's an interesting phrase. Morning star language in Revelation 2.28 is messianic. It refers to a divine being who would come from Judah. And we know this from Numbers 24.17. A star will go out from, from Jacob and a scepter will rise from Israel. Later in the book of Revelation, Jesus uses the same language of himself. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Jesus grants his authority to you. Okay, you rule the nations with him. As if that's not enough, we got Revelation 3. Okay, this is the, you know, we've all seen the picture of Jesus knocking at the door. And that's all we remember in the passage. Okay? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, indeed I will come into him and dine with him. There you go, there you go with the cosmic meal. I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me, the one who conquers, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also have conquered and have sat down with my father on his throne. Okay, if we're going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, if we're going to do, you know, who rules the nations now? The fallen sons of God. Now, Paul, as I said earlier, connects the resurrection of Jesus with the nullification of their power. He does this in five or six passages, that the resurrection somehow results in the defeat of the rulers, the authorities, the principalities of power, so on and so forth. What that means is, I mean, I, I wish, well, it, it, the, audio, the audio is terrible, but I got invited to a pagan podcast a couple years ago. You're, you're going to love this. I get an email from a guy who signed the email as Hercules. <laughs> you know, when you get an email from Hercules, <laughs> there's a lot of things that go through your mind. <laughs> so... So his, his show was called The Voice of Olympus. And in the, in the email, he says, look, he goes, you know, I know you're a Christian, I'm a pagan. He goes, but I just read your little book, Supernatural, and I loved it. Will you come on my show? And so I'm like, well, this will be interesting, why not? <laughs> so I said, yeah, and, and again, I, I've, I've actually been on the show twice now, but, and I recommend listening to it. <laughs> I, rec I know why you're laughing. And I'll tell them that too, okay? Um, so, you know, I go on this show, and he's excited, and, and he tells me, he's like, I just can't have this conversation with, like, anybody else. I, I, it's hard for me to find people to, to talk about this sort of stuff with, and I'm thinking, yeah, I bet it is. <laughs> you know? So... But again, he's, he's a really, really nice guy. We just had a good time. But for the first, like, 10 minutes of the show, he's reading me Greco-Roman pagan religious texts with the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. And I'm like, this is awesome. I mean, I'm really learning something here. I mean, I knew of a few references in, you know, Plato, but, like, this guy, this guy knows them. And he goes, he goes, this is why I was so excited. The Bible has the same worldview as this other stuff. And he says, I have one question. So it's a really good interview. I got one question. <laughs> he goes, I got one question. If Yahweh, the most high in the Bible, set this whole thing up where he divorced the nations and he assigned other gods to them and then those people are supposed to, you know, not be related to Yahweh but, but these other gods and this is the situation that develops... What does he want? And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> because it, it, it was a good opportunity because this is what I felt like Paul for a day, or for at least a couple hours. Because Paul goes into a pagan city and he knows that they share the worldview. So he can go into to, you know, pagan turf and he says, look, look, fellas, I, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, look, we worship the gods we worship and you Jews do something else because this is the way the gods want it. The nations are allotted to the gods. And that means, you know, if, if we like forsake our gods, we're in big trouble because they're going to be angry at us because they're the ones that set this thing up. And so Paul would say, well, I mean, that, that's pretty good. You know, we have, we have the same worldview, but, but uh, there's a little twist on it that you're missing. The Most High, yes, you're correct, set up this system. This is why in the, in the biblical story, everybody knows the true God at one point, and then you know, get all these pantheons and stuff. So you're right. The Most High sentenced, judged the nations, and allotted these other gods to them. He didn't want them to be worshipped, but that's what happened. We got Psalm 82. We know that that's what happened. And, and yeah, that, that's the biblical worldview and the biblical story. But the neat thing, and here's what you're missing, the neat thing is that the same Most High became a man, Jesus of Nazareth. And he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead, 
And now the same Most High is coming to you. The same one that gave these gods their authority in the first place has now taken it back. Their authority is nullified. You don't need to be afraid of these other gods when I tell you that the Most High wants you back in the family. So I, you know, I actually gave this answer to this guy on the show. And, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, at least a seed was planted. He had me back, so he wasn't real mad. But the funny thing was, and I think this is why Stovall's laughing, during the commercial breaks of this show, there's this deep, dark, sinister voice that comes on in between your, your segments and says, this is the Pagan Podcast Network. All <laughs> pagan, all the time. And I thought, not today. <laughs> so so it, it, was, it was fun. But, but, I mean, think about the worldview. This is why Paul says, look, when Christ rose from the dead, their dominion ended. They have no legitimate authority over the people they enslave. Now, they're not going away because they want their turf. They want to resist, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I mean, this, this, is, this is not just the Pauline message, it's the message of the gospel. So you don't have to feel like you're doing something wrong like, like you're, you're violating the Most High's will because he's the one that, that you know, he's the orig originator of all this because of what happened at Babel. Paul says he not only wants you back, he insists on it. They do not have legitimate authority anymore. Just like Satan has no legitimate claim over the soul of any member of the kingdom of God. This, you know, Christ ascends, the Spirit comes, and that helps us combat depravity. I mean, the Messiah is supposed to address all of these problems we talked about in the last hour. And, you know, this is part of our destiny. So the last slide here, I said we would come back to this, this graphic. You know, if we're here and we have, you know, back here, we have legitimate authority. This is our destiny, to have authority over the nations in the New Eden. Okay, this is the book of Revelation, the end of days, the transition to the age to come we will in fact displace and replace the sons of God who are in rebellion. This is why we're introduced in the council in Hebrews 2 because believers are the reconstituted family and council of God. That's what we are. And Paul, as I alluded to a little earlier, his language becomes decipherable. When you look at the, at the, the structure, how they conceive the council, the sons of God, it, are, is the elite tier in the middle. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 says, don't you people know, apparently they didn't, <laughs> that the holy ones will judge the world. Most of your translations are going to have saints. I really hate that translation, by the way. Holy ones. It's supposed to take your mind back to the supernatural realm, to the divine council composed of holy ones. And Paul says, don't you know that the holy ones will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, that would mean you're the holy ones. Are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Don't you know that we are to judge angels? We will judge the middle tier in that we will replace it. And we outrank the bottom tier. We are the ones who share the throne. We are the ones who will rule the nations with the rod of iron. Again, all these descriptions. In the end, we have a global Eden with humanity blended into the family of God. You've got the two families brought together. Humanity is fit for sacred space. Sacred space covers the entire globe. And, and the end point is God gets his way. That's why it ends with, with a global Eden. God gets what he originally wanted. But we've got this whole you know, epic arc of the history of salvation going on between Eden and this other Eden over here. 
And there are just things, again, we're wrapping up here still, but there are just things that, again, will, you'll lose the meaning of certain things if you don't do what you can to, you know, try to pick up the breadcrumbs, you know, of, of what's going on. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about spiritual warfare, for instance. You know, spiritual warfare is about the conflict between two kingdoms. We are never told, you know, I, I should, I think I might have included this. Oh, yeah, I did. Let me go to one, this one slide right here. We are, we are told to, uh, we're never told to go into certain areas and cities and regions and just yell at demons. We're not told to do that. You know, demons, again, are low-level players. They, in, they inflict harm upon individual persons. But intelligent evil that has geographical dominion and is concerned with empires, like in Daniel, it has better things to do than turn people into sock puppets made of flesh. It's got bigger, bigger fish to fry. It is about controlling people through, you know, intelligent means. How would you control a population in an empire? You manipulate the humans that are in charge. I mean, in that case, they're basically willing idolaters, so it's not really that difficult. But the same thing happens now. Intelligent evil wants to move herds. It wants to control hearts and minds. It's about how you think. It's about big things like, who am I? What's my mission? Idolatry, in other words, being distracted from the worship, from loyalty to the true God, to anything else. It's about self-destruction through the things we do or or that we don't do. Intelligent evil knows what buttons to push. And it doesn't have, you don't have to have a demon behind every, every rock. You don't have to have, oh, a demon made me do this. No, we can destroy ourselves just fine by ourselves. But to move herds of people in one direction or the other and toward idolatry and away from the truth, that takes an intelligent plan. And supernatural beings can do this. Again, if I were a supernatural evil being, I know what I would do. I would get to leaders in government and in media. Because if I get a handful of those people dedicated to chaos, that's going to be real effective. I'm not going to work hard. I'm going to work smart. Now, what are we told to do? We are tasked not with, you know, going out and doing, you know, strange rituals and yelling at demons and all this kind of stuff. What are, what are they scared of? I'll tell you what they're scared of. They're scared of the kingdom of God. Because in first, in Romans 11, Paul specifically talk, he's talking about, he's talking about the return of the Messiah. He's talking about the revival of Israel. Okay. And he specifically says, and he says it in Corinthians as well, that essentially the Lord is not going to come back until the fullness of the Gentiles has been brought in. Because then that will launch, initiate the revival of Israel so that all Israel will be saved. Again, it's a debated thing as to what the phrase means, but what I don't want you to lose sight of is the fullness of the Gentiles is key to the day of the Lord and the return of the Lord. Fullness of the Gentiles is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. So what we are tasked with is what Jesus actually told us to do before he ascended. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. See, that's Matthew 28, 19, but you know what the verse earlier says to it? All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. It's not just for the Jew, it's for all the nations. Go therefore and make disciples of every nation. It's the fullness of the Gentiles idea. And I was talking to Stovall last night, I think people, when you talk about this, they get paralyzed by the, by the, the overwhelming feel of the task. I've left this on, on the board for a reason. The problem with the fulfillment of the Great Commission 
It's not getting done for a number of reasons, but one of them is not math. This is from a Pew survey recently. It, it actually used census data. As of 2014, there were 25.4% of the U.S. population that, that called themselves evangelicals. Evangelicals are supposed to know what the gospel is. Now, you can say, well, a lot of evangelicals really don't. Okay, I'll grant you that. Let's cut it in half. Instead of 80 million, you know, that percentage calculates out to 81 million, let's go with 40. The world population at present rate is estimated right now, 2018 anyway, 7.6 billion. It's supposed to be near 10 billion by 2050. If 40 million people, again, half the evangelical population, evangelizes one person each in 2019, by this time next year, we'll have 80. And then in 2020, we'll have 160. And then we have 320, 640. Now, in, in only four years, we're up over a billion. By 2026, or 2027, 23 years early, we cover every last human being on the planet. Look, the, the problem is not math. But it's very easy to get overwhelmed with the thought of the task. It's not math. So why isn't it getting done? It's not, it's, it's not getting done because of other issues. We're, frag we don't, we're fragmented in the church. How are we supposed to make, how are we supposed to illustrate life as God intended it to be in Eden? where everything is unity, there's wholeness. Again, a, a little slice of what it must be like to live in God's house, in his presence. There's justice, there's wholeness, there's loyalty to the true God, you know, through the gospel. You know, if, if, you've, if you listen to me for any amount of time, the gospel is about believing loyalty. Everything we covered today frames what it means to be a believer. I like to use Naaman. I mean, I, I rarely preach sermons, but I, 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 my, my first sermon since 2004, I think, was like last year. And I did the Naaman passage, the Naaman the leper, because Naaman and the widow of Zarephath are used by Jesus as two examples of faith. Like, why didn't he pick Abraham? Or like, you know, somebody famous. I mean, who are these? They're pagans. They're both pagans. Naaman and the widow of Zarephath is from Sidon, near Tyre or Sidon. She, she's, she's Phoenician, okay? Why is he picking these people? Because they both do things that demonstrate they will worship no God other than Yahweh. You know, Naaman says, now I know that Yahweh is the God of all gods and I will worship no other Okay, it's belief that this is the true God, he is who he says he is, and that for some reason that I don't quite understand, he loves me, he made a covenant with Israel, I'm allowed to join that if I throw my loyalty over to him and will worship no other. Hey, I got news for you, Naaman's not keeping the Torah. Naaman goes back to Syria. There is no Torah, he's never gonna you know, like do a festival, he's never gonna do Jewish stuff but he has the one thing that he needs. He knows the one thing that is critical and crucial. And he assigns his loyalty to the true God. And that's, that's his theology. End of story. And again, the widow of Zarephath does the same thing in, in different actions that she does. Again, what, what's the point? Well, the point is, Believing loyalty is the issue. Now we're asked to believe the gospel. The gospel is that this same God, Yahweh, okay, the Most High, became a man, died on a cross, and rose again for the sins of the world. This is the only means of salvation. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one comes to the Father except by me. That's what you need to believe. It has nothing to do with your performance, 
While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for us while we were cleaning up our act, while we were learning theology. You know, while we were, you know, fill in the blank. Before we had a single thought about, you know, caring about what God thought at all, while we were yet sinners, while we, Paul says, while we were enemies, okay, Christ died for us. So, this, I mean, this is the task, and we're supposed to illustrate the message of salvation. We become part of God's family. We're supposed to live in a certain way so that the people outside will want to be part of the community. But if we have our own fragmentation, you know, our own issues, if we can't take care of them here, how are we going to restore Jesus' reputation 